Let me just record this correct. And was it there? Okay. So it is recording now. It's a good things. Otherwise, I need to go and record it again to have it everything there. Uh, great. Uh, okay. So uh, this is the. We talk about probability theory crash course on that one. Now we are talking about, we can easily talk about randomized algorithm. Randomized algorithms are the one that are very effective type of algorithm. It has been hot all over the time because this is like, it was not the down time for them. Generally, every time the people try to use it and even now more than before. Uh, so and to analyze the randomized algorithm, we needed the probability theory that we discussed before. So here we talk about uh, some algorithm like quick sort and hashing that they are actually using probability, but you will see maybe more actually in this class and lots of other places, courses that you may have. Okay, so uh, what is a quick sort? Like, uh, let's understand this one and then how can we analyze it? So uh, here, uh, Uh, good. So, uh, in the, generally, the source algorithms are some kind of uh, uh, like a divide and conquer. So, the source algorithms are generally divide and conquer. Mm. Yeah, uh, divide and conquer algorithm that we have it here. And uh, like uh, we have seen for merge sort that we have just divided into two parts, then we will sort it each of them and then we merge. The issue is that merge sort, however, it was that it was not an in place sort because you need to have two arrays and then you need to merge it in the third. Arrays. The good things that we are talking about here is about the quick sort is that this is an in place sort. So quick sort is an in place sort. And by the way, this in place actually is a very useful thing in uh, Python. But if especially if you're using some sort things or some kind of pandas or other things, it is important you will put it in place is equal to true or false. And if it's in place is equal to true, then it's just doing the same place. If you say in place is false, you need to make it equal to another variables or the same things. So in place is an important word essentially in Python especially. And of course in sorting. So what do we do for quick sort? So the idea for quick sort is this one. And then you have an array here and a number which is called pivot. So what is X? So X is a number which is called a pivot. And again, the main thing here is about, I mean, here is not just per se to know what is quick sort. The issue is the how can we analyze quick sort? Because the same type of things you may do it for any other algorithm, as you will see actually some other applications of that. So say if X, so if this guy is like, a, a, the, a, somehow the guy that if you sort this array, this X is the middle guy. Good. So if, this, if X is kind of the middle guy, it, uh, I mean, uh, you can uh, uh, call it, uh, I think, uh, yeah. So if X is the guy that when you sort the array is the middle guy, of course, we don't know that guy. That's the part that we are doing randomization. Uh, however, if you know who is that guy, then what can we do? Then we can consider this X guys. All those guys, which are less than these guys, will come to the first part of the array. All guys that are larger than this guy are go to the second part of the array. Then we can quickly, uh, essentially, then we can sort these guys and sort these guys, and then we are done, correct? So if we know this X guy, the middle guy, then it would be easy. All, all elements less than this guy will go to the left part. All elements larger than that will go to the right part. And then we can just recurse there and essentially sort them, and everything would be in place. And that's essentially the idea of uh, quick sort. 
everything, if everything goes perfect, then it, we should have, I mean, then the running time of this, so if we can, uh, if we know this X, <clears throat> and then if we can just uh, say in linear time, we can put the elements which are less than X and elements greater than X. So the running time of this would be two times, like if this is a T of N, or N thing would be two times, uh, I will say the, uh, the floor of n over two, because each of these guys would be less than, I mean, n over floor of n over two, because this guy is the middle guy, plus order n. So this is the one that we can just use this kind of master theorem, or we have seen a very similar uh, to that one, and the mirror sort, and the running time of this algorithm would be n like n. What, what is your question? Do you mean like two times t of? Yes, sorry. T of, and thanks for this. Two times t of that. And we know that two times t of that, it is essentially that it is, yeah, two times t of that. And then we should be in a good shape. But there are a few things that we need to have that one to get this n log n. And as we discussed, this n log n is actually the best that we can hope for for any sort of for any comparison based on that. We discussed that one. So a few things that I need to mention. The first thing is that, how can we find X? That's one thing. So of course we don't know if we knew X, maybe we know lots of other things. We don't know X. That's the reason that we will consider X as a random array, random element of the array. So when we have the given X, we will consider we are just choosing a random number between zero to N minus one. And we say that X is an uh, array of X. So if this is the array, we will say X would be, so X would be uh, equal to array of I for some random I. Good. That's a, that's a first thing. So that's a, somehow it solved the problem. We don't know X, take it random. Then we need to analyze it and we are using the randomization to do the analysis. So that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing that we need, and it is important is that if we know X, say we know X, how can we send the elements be smaller than X and the elements larger than X in the both side of X. And we want to do it in place and with order N. That's the one that we need to discuss. And then we want to see what would be the analysis of the things if we are doing the random way and then what is the result that we can get. Okay, so, uh, so I mentioned the pivot X would be uh, some random element. Actually, uh, you can uh, think about this one that if you are assuming the input array is somehow random, you don't need to actually even choose X to be array I. You can just always choose X be array one. But this is under assumption that uh, this X, uh, this array is like a random array that you will get it. Not the one that adversary gives you because if adversary give you a bad array, then if you always choose array one, then you actually may get, so, so and that's also important. This, uh, this, uh, this one, if this, you are not doing this one correctly, then the running time of this algorithm actually would be order n to the two. Uh, so uh, let me actually discuss that one also. Why is it the case? So why if this, uh, so this pivot X, it is important to be the middle guy. Uh, so what will happen if this X guy is not the middle guy? So if this X guy is actually X, X is just array one. So if the, uh, in some sense, we consider the first element, like consider the sorted array, the minimum element, if we consider X to be the minimum element. Let me just say, so if X is the minimum guy, 
then what will happen? The issue is that, I mean, what would be the running time in this case would be T of X. So assume that X is always the minimum guy. Good. And that can be the case. So for example, if X is a, if the whole thing is a sorted array essentially. So then the T of N would be equal to, so uh, then uh, you will have this one. So uh, this is the first guy. So it would be T of zero. So there is no element less than this guy plus T of N minus one. Plus order N. Good. The T of zero is equal to zero in this case. So the running time would be T of N is equal to T of N minus one plus order N. And this is actually, we have seen it. So if, if you just do the expansion, as we have seen it, then it would be just actually would be equal to N. Say it is instead of N, it is just N. It would be, so the T of N essentially would be equal to, T of N would be equal to one plus two plus, n, which is essentially order n square. So if this x guy actually is not the middle guy, but just the first guy, then the running time of this algorithm will be bad. In particular, if you just, uh, so if you are, uh, say, uh, if you always take x equal to array one, and you know that this array is sorted, the running time of this algorithm would be n square. Would be not an efficient algorithm, like selection sorts or other things. That you so it is important that we will understand that this x guy should be the middle guy. So if you know that the input array is not coming from an adversary. So here, in some sense, if the algorithm knows what you are doing, if you just put it x is equal to array one or array zero, essentially, the first element. And this element, adversary knows that it is your algorithm, always just gives you a sorted array, and then you are doing this. But of course, if there is no such a bad adversary, the, the input is a random thing, so you can just put it uh, essentially uh, pivot equal to array one. So you will see some implementations of quick sort that they are putting x is equal to array zero or array one, essentially the first element. Uh, however, if you want to get the, I mean, to be in a good shape, you can just actually use the randomized one and generate i to be a random number between zero and n minus one. And we see that in that case, the average running time or expected running time, average and expected are the same. That's a discuss. That would be n like. And in practice, it is quick sort is really fast. It's much faster than merge sort. Okay, so uh, let me just mention uh, these uh, things for that one. So I need to mention uh, two things here. So one important thing is that uh, this order n, if, if I know x, how can I do these things? So, uh, uh, so uh, this is the one that I will call it partition. So uh, what is the quick, al quick sort algorithm? So the quick sort algorithm is this algorithm. Like very simple algorithm. So you are doing this one. Uh, you are giving L and R. So this is the array essentially that we have it. And this is the array. And you are giving L the left pointer and R. You want to sort them. And X is the, uh, I mean, uh, mm, yes. So, uh, Just make sure that, yeah. So, uh, so here actually is X is the array that you want to sort. So you don't really need to have this X. So X is the array in some sense. But you can give a pointer to the array so you don't need to. So in some sense is L and R is the means. And say this is the array. So what do you do? You will first, you need to find some uh, partition. It partition means essentially, uh, you need to find a pivot X, which is uh, array I. For some random I. So 
x would be array i for some random i. And then you need to do the partition, the one that we will talk about it now. After that, it would be easy. So uh, then, uh, I mean, uh, you will do this one. So this, uh, what is the pivot index? The pivot index is the correct place that this pivot should be there. So we know that x is an array i. So x should be somewhere when it is sorted. Good. Say so this is the uh, this is the index of that. So this is the pivot index. So this, when we sort it, that will go this one called the pivot index. So you will find this pivot index, then you will sort from L to pivot index minus one. So it is the, if this is the pivot index, we will call it, this is, so we will call it pivot minus one. And then you will do it the other, so this is the pivot index. This is the pivot index minus one. And here you are doing it with pivot index plus one. This is the one. So you will sort, uh, um, let me just use some color. So you will sort uh, this part of the array and then So you will sort, oh, I'm going to delete it. So this is the array that we had it. And so you will sort essentially this part of the array, and then you will sort this part of the array recursively. So the, in this part is very similar to essentially binary search. Yeah. Wait, the index is not i. It's um, just the middle of the array. Sorry, what was that? The pivot index. Are we setting it to i or are we setting it to the middle? No, no. I mean, as I mentioned, if you know that, the, so it's always better to just put the random number. Because as I mentioned, minimum you can do it, but the assumption is that the input is not adversary. But this one, even I mean, it is essentially for any as long as the adversary does not know your random choices. Because if it knows the random choices, it may do essentially do that bad thing that happened with the uh, that minimum six. But as long as the adversary does not know what are the random choices that you have, that it works even for any adversary. In average, we get uh, n log n. Good. So this is the array uh, for random i, and this is the. Uh, so we talk about this. This now uh, let's uh, see what can we do here for this algorithm. Okay, so uh, so so is the algorithm clear? The people at Zoom, does it make sense? Yep. So we just do this once, and then we are doing this recursion part and this recursion part, and then that's. It. And everything is in place. Now let's go to partition. How can we do the partition? So the partition actually is not that hard as well. So the partition is something like this. Uh, you have a <coughs> L and you have R. Good. And as I mentioned, the pivot is some uh, array I for some random I. Say, assume that, I mean, for now, even the arrays, you can always assume that the, no two elements of array are the same because you can add some small random noise to everything and make sure that no two elements of array are the same. But it's a bit worse for that case. But just for now, think about that no two elements are exactly equal. Good. Now, what do we do here? Uh, so we will consider, and we know that this pivot. So the pivot was array i. I mean, in some sense, it is just some random element from the array. So that's the thing that we need. So maybe I just uh, remove it actually here. So we have chosen like this, and then, I mean, this is just some number. Uh, good. Uh, 
Now what do we do? So we will consider this L and R and we bring R in this way and L in this way. What do we do here? We are doing, uh, Uh, the way that we are doing, we are doing some kind of linear search in the array. So this L will come as long as, so we know that this left guy should be less than pivot, right guy should be greater than pivot, correct? So as long as L is less than, so we will increase L, increase L, uh, as long as, Or maybe actually it's better if I just change that one and say, until uh, X of L is greater than So you will increase it. As long as this guy is less than pivot, we know that it's a correct place. It should be in the left one. So we just increase it. The same thing, we are decreasing R until what happens? X R less than, less than pivot. And as I mentioned, that's the reason that I mentioned for the simplicity. And actually, it is you can always add this random noise. But assume that there is no two elements are equal. You can so it can solve it essentially for equal. Then you can put it greater than or equal. But that should be fine. Good. So we do that. Like we are also decreasing. Whenever so we know that this is the, and this is the guy that should be not here. And this is, uh, look, this is the, uh, for example, this is the, say, yeah, we call it essentially this one, <coughs> Y guy. And this Y, we call it Z guy. So we know that Y and Z essentially should be not in the correct place. Then what do we do? The swap. So you will just swap them and you will just continue. Because now this guy is in the correct place, this guy is correct place, you will continue until L and R essentially passing each other. Like you will do this one until uh, somehow R becomes less than. Actually, as soon as this uh, uh, element uh, I uh, Yeah, so uh, uh, when uh, this L and R essentially, um, this uh, R guys uh, passing uh, this, uh, then you, you are actually in a uh, good place. Uh, yeah, uh, let me just also, I mean, change a little bit. Uh, this is the only thing that I wanted to, Uh, yeah, go ahead. When you're increasing R and decreasing R, should one keep on the XL and the XR after you swap and then you continue? So like increasing R and decreasing R? No, and then you are done at that. So in that point, actually when L becomes equal to R, uh, so when L becomes equal to R, that's exactly the place of XI. So this, uh, sorry, the pivot. So uh, uh, that's uh, essentially is uh, the way that we can uh, do these things. So at that time, you know that you need to pivot actually should be equal, uh, the array R should be equal to pivot. Good. So because you know that everything greater than this guy is there and everything less than this guy is there, and then this is the case. So, if, so this is the thing that I have mentioned. So uh, like 
this is the, this is the whole algorithm. But if you want to even implement it a bit in a more clean way, uh, you can actually do this as well. Uh, so this pivot, there is no need to be an element of array. Good. It can be element of array plus some noise. So you can actually, when we choose array i, you can add some, uh, say this one plus epsilon. For a small epsilon. For a small uh, noise. Epsilon. Good. So in this case, if you know that, so why do we add this uh, noise epsilon to array? So this noise epsilon, we are adding it to just make sure that this guy is, the pivot is not an element of array. So if it is not element of array, then it will be actually simpler. When L becomes equal to R, you don't need to put the pivot in the correct place because this element actually was not an element of array. And we know that at this time, all these guys are less than this pivot and all these guys are greater than pivot. So at that time, actually we are done. So here, if you remember, I mentioned that when we put the pivot in the correct place, so this is the correct place of pivot. Then we can uh, essentially do the uh, things, the recursion from one before that and one after that. But if the pivot is not an element of array, that is, is everything would be fine. So you just, there is, you know that this guy was not there. So you just do it from, I don't know, from the pivot in one of them and then from one like that. So then instead of doing from here, one less, for the right guys, actually you are doing until here, for the next one you are doing, because in some sense there is, I mean, no, this guy is not there. So you know that when L becomes equal to R, so when L becomes to R essentially, you are doing it from the beginning until this L, which is equal to R. And then from one after that to the end of the array, you will do for the next. Anyhow, these are some kind of, I mean, things that you can just go on. I mean, for example, uh, see the implementation in geek for geeks There are a good amount of things on that one. These are the tricks that you can do it, such as special cases, like by this random noise, you make sure that, I mean, the, and, <clears throat> uh, you are not, uh, essentially, you are not leaving any, any element behind. That's the whole idea, essentially. And uh, that's... Uh, yeah. What was that? Yeah, yeah. So after you are swapping, then you will continue this process. So when you swap it, then you know that this guy now is less than uh, pivot. This guy is uh, this guy is greater than pivot, and this guy is less than pivot. So you can continue this operation. Good. So you can just continue this. And uh, until, uh, as I mentioned, so you will bring this guy here and this guy here until L passes R or L becomes equal to R. At that time, you will stop. Yeah? Um, if they are both greater than the pivot, um, do we just move the R over? No, they cannot be both greater than pivot. What do you mean both greater than pivot? So the pivot was three, and then we had like four or five, like arrows four and five. Uh, so, so repeat your question. I'm saying like, um, when we're going from left to right, if arrows, if arrows are greater than the uh, No, uh, you see, for these guys, as I mentioned, you will continue this guy for, you will continue L guy, uh, R guys, you will decrease it as long as these guys are, greater than the pivot. As long as it becomes less than the pivot, you will stop. Then here also you are doing from the left, you are coming from the left and the first time that uh, this guy is greater than pivot, you will stop. At that time you will replace. So there's no bad cases happening. Yeah? Okay, um, when it's equal to zero, it's not 
Yeah, 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 yeah. As I mentioned, to, uh, you can, I mean, the way that it's mentioned here, this is the one you say that uh, as long as uh, you will move it, uh, so the actual implementation here, I mean, uh, for the simpler things, assume that is, uh, there is no equal to pivot. How can we make sure that there is no equal to pivot? Just add a random noise epsilon to the pivot. That's the simplest way of implementing it. Then in this case, I mean, there would be just two arrays and then you will just do that and recurse on that. But, but if they are equal to pivot, then these conditions that you are moving L and R, for one of them, you should have uh, as long as if either, so instead of this one, instead of saying until X greater than this one, I will say until X greater than uh, or equal to pivot. One of them, you need to add equality. Not both of them, one of them you can add. One of them. Uh, 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 one of them, only one of them you need to add. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is the one that you can see the exact implementation. I mean, uh, with adding epsilon or without adding epsilon, you can see this one. And these are just some corner cases that you need to make sure that you don't miss anything. But the logic is the one that I have. Uh, good. Yes. You have a question? Um, no. Good. So that's the algorithm. Now let's uh, talk about the analysis of this algorithm. Uh, good. So the analysis of the algorithm, uh, as I mentioned, if we can make sure that everything happens essentially half-half, then we have n log n. If uh, we know that if it is a sorted order, it, one of them becomes very imbalanced. So the main question is that how imbalanced are these guys? If these guys are not as almost balanced or within constant factor of each other, then actually you will get n log n. So you don't need to get exactly half as long as one of these guys each of these guys is at least one greater than one third of the total size, and still you get n log. That's the reason that actually in practice, this is a very good and fast algorithm. But if it is a worst case that one guy gets a zero, the other guy gets n minus one, in that case, actually it can, the bad case can happen. Now, but we are doing essentially, we are getting the pivot at random. So let's uh, actually analyze the algorithm. So uh, we know that uh, essentially each element, so uh, so we know that each element of the array, so this is the each element of array actually, has the probability of one over n to be pivot. Good. So assume that uh, the ice element, by ice, I mean, I will say ice in terms of rank. And is pivot. And as I mentioned, I is the rank. So each element of the array has a rank, correct? Uh, when it is sorted. We don't know the sorting, but we can still define the rank for each element. Then when we sort it, this is the first element, this is the second element, third element, two and seven. Good. Assume that the ice, consider the ice element. We are checking, choosing one of them at random. So at, it can be any element, the rank from one to n can be chosen, correct? Assume that this is the ice guy. Then what is the running time of this algorithm? So the running time would be n minus one. This n minus one essentially is for that partition algorithm that we discussed. So that is for partition. Then we have ti minus one. Why? Because we need to go essentially. Uh, so this is this is that is the guy. So if this is the ice guy, so the, we are assuming the ice guys are here. Then this is 
uh, i minus one guys which are here and n minus i guys which are good so the running time would be n minus one plus the i minus one plus n minus one. However, uh, uh, okay, but the issue is that, of course, uh, we, this is if it is ice element. Is we know that what is the chance that ice elements is chosen as a pivot one over n because there are n elements. Good. So, what is the average or expected running time of this algorithm? So, expected running time you can say essentially Tn or expected Tn, that is fine. But then here you also need to have expected Tn. And actually, here we are using the linearity of expectation essentially to do that. So what do we do? We said the expected running time of this algorithm would be one over n, because each element can be chosen at one over n. And then uh, for this case, it, so i equal to one to n, uh, n minus one plus ti minus one plus t n minus i. So this, what is this one? This is the running time if the ice element is chosen. And then what is the chance that this guy is doing is one over n. And we are considering the expectation. But so when we have the expectation, we need to create this weighted average. And the weighted, what is the weight is one over n because each element is correct. Good. So here we can say Tn is actually is the expected running time. Uh, and the question is that, and this is important, when we got this i minus one, again, we are talking the expected running time of this algorithm because this is also a randomized algorithm. So here, uh, I mean, I just delete these guys. So I assume that Tn actually is the, Here, I assume that actually Tn is the expected running time. So it is. This is expected running time. Good. So that would be the running time. So now I just simplify. So this n minus one, uh, I can just, I have one over n. This is uh, n times I will sum it up. So I can just actually bring this one out of this parenthesis. So this n minus one can bring out of this. Sometimes this is the same thing that we discussed. If you have expectation and n minus one inside the expectation, you can just bring it down. Then what is the running time of this guy? One over n is this one. This guy, actually, you can write this one. Let me just connect it to the laptop. This is one important thing that when you use the this. Zoom, uh, then you need to be more careful even in terms of the, because it spends much more energy. Uh, good. Okay, so uh, then what can we do here? Then it is not that hard. Why? Because we have these things essentially, Ti minus one plus Tn minus one. But here, one of them essentially goes from one to n. So, uh, uh, so this one actually we can just, divide it into two parts, say one over n, i equal to one to n, ti minus one. I just separate them, good? i equal to one to n, ti minus one. The other one is one over n, i is equal to one to n, tn minus i. Good. So in this case, actually these two are equal because one is goes from, essentially you can just change the index. So this guy starts from, uh, yeah. So this guy starts from i equal. To, so if put i equal to zero, what would be this this guy? So let me just put this one. So this one would be essentially t zero plus t 
t1 until t n minus 1. The other one would be this. The, so this one would be n minus, uh, so I equal to one, so it would be t of n minus one plus t of n minus two and so on and so forth until the last one would be n. So it would be t of zero. So these two are the same thing essentially. Just one goes from down from zero to n minus one, the other one goes from n, n minus one to zero. So I will just mention that it is two, two times over n, I equal to zero to n minus one t of i. Now this formula is the one actually that we have seen it before. If you remember one of the latest one that we have solved the recurrence formula, that was exactly this formula. That T of N was equal to N minus one plus two N over this one. We already have the analysis for that in the previous session when we talk about the recurrence formulations. And we got actually at that time T of N would be order N back. N. So we don't repeat that. You can just go to that lecture of, uh, the one uh, for the recurrence formulas, how can we solve them? And we have solved this particular formula. So we have done the same thing for Mercer also. We discussed about the analysis before, and then we may say, okay, the Mercer is the one that we had the formula. So this would be n log n, the average time. But in practice, actually, quick sort is very fast sort. So this is the one actually we are using the expectation and the fact that this is a typical thing that when the ice element is chosen, then what would be the running time and then you can do it. You are using linearity of expectations. Uh, good. And the other thing that I wanted to mention uh, that uh, so we have seen I mean, several algorithms. Some of them are order n square. Mm -hmm. So some of these algorithms were n square like insertion or selection sort to n log n for mere sort, but it was not in place sort. But here, actually, quick sort is in average and log n. We are talking about another one, which is in place sort as well. It's a heap sort that, that actually is also in place. Again, these are the main thing that you get familiar with this one. For example, there is this concept of like STL that we discussed in C++. And so you need to work with them such that you get familiar how, where you should use which algorithm. And sometimes we are just using those operations. Uh, anyhow. So any algorithm, which is a, like a comparison base. Comparison base is that we just compare them. Running sort, it was not like that. So we were considering, for example, we were considering the fact that these elements that we have are, have D digits. Good. But uh, when we talk about a, a comparison based algorithm, we really don't care about how many digits they have. One of them can be very huge. I don't know, 100,000 digits. That's fine. Either. The only operation that you can you you can think about an oracle, but independent of how large are these numbers, just when you compare it, say that the first number is greater than the other one, or vice versa, or they are equal. If you can, and these are the type of things that we have done it for merge sort or for uh, quick sort, but not for radix sort. In the radix sort, we will say, okay, if they have D digit, D digit. And digits, then in that case, then the running time would be order D or like DN or something like this. Good. So for those algorithms, for all comparison based algorithms, the running time is N like it. So I just give you, you can read the formal proof in the book. I just want to give you the idea. This comes from the idea of decision trees. So 
So what are decision trees? So this is the thing that comes essentially from the idea of uh, decision trees. Uh, so um, a decision tree is the one that, uh, so uh, like uh, when you do compare, so you will compare two elements. So you have, a, this is the idea that you have n elements in the array. You want to, I say they are not equal. I say none of them are equal. Then you want to give them a sort. So if these elements are given to you, how many possible way of sorting is possible? Like we have for this one. The output, how many uh, outputs, how many forms of the output can we have? So your n elements are n elements are given in an array to you. And then they are saying none of no two of them are equal. How many possible output can we have potentially? Factorial. And factorial, correct? Yeah, because each of them can be the correct thing. We don't know why. Essentially, any permutation of the input can be a possible output. Now, in a decision tree, so we are talking about the decision tree. So when you do the comparison between two elements, I say no two of them are equal. So you will say essentially the element I don't know, x versus the element y. And x, I, and, x and y are two elements among the given elements. Good. Depending on the fact that it is x is less than y or y is less than x, as I mentioned, no two of them are equal. Depending on that, whether in this case it is, it means that after the comparison, x is less than y, or it says that actually y is less than x. You are going to two branches of this tree. That's the thing that is called decision trees. So you are essentially I have a tree structure or hierarchical structure. So you know that if x is less than y, something happens. And if y is less than x, something else happens. You know that at the end of this, so when you come, so and then you will continue, then you are doing another comparison and then, I don't know, this time maybe you will compare here some other elements, maybe Z and W, you will compare it. And again, Z and W, some of them can be actually Y and X, that's fine. You will do that at the end when you are doing that, you are doing some comparison. So in some sense, that's the idea. So any comparison-based algorithm, you can essentially be presented with a decision tree that is doing that. And when you do that, at the end, when this algorithm is done, it should give you a permutations here of the element. So when I I'm doing some comparison at the end, say, okay, this is your final answer. We know that this is a permutation. So we know that this is a permutation of the input. And we know that all, so this is called the leaf of a tree. Leaf of the tree is the one that we are done essentially. We will talk more about this graph theory things, but this is, I think the tree you should be able to understand. You have two branches and then uh, each of them, I mean, based on the result of the comparison, you may go to one of these branches. At the end, when you, you are done, you have a permutation as the output. And we know that all permutations all permutations should appear as leaves of the tree. Good. So how many leaves do we have? We should have this tree in this tree. N factorial, right? And because there are n factorial possibilities. So we have n factorial leaves. Because there are n factorial permutations. And in addition, what do we have here? Uh, we have this uh, additional things uh, that it is a binary tree. 
because you are just doing either this one is the standard or that. Yeah. I mean, uh, at this permutation, it, yes, I mean, the final sorted permutation essentially. Uh, and again, at the beginning, you don't know which one of them, but when you are doing it, when the final, uh, uh, in some sense, you can think about this one. Like, if this is, this is a given array to you, some permutations of indices of this array would be the sorted array. This is the, this is the one that I'm talking about. So, like, are the <clears throat> Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, uh, yes, I mean, given essentially, this is the thing, given the instance that is, given the instance that is given to you, the instance that is given to you, then all of them can be the potential things. So uh, we don't know. So depending on this comparison, this algorithm always go a pass from this one to this one. Depending on what is the input, you may take any of these paths. That's the thing that we have all possibilities. So in some sense, each algorithm is just a pass from the root to one leaf in each running time of an algorithm. Now, if we have n factorial leaves, binary tree, we know that the depth of this is omega n like n. What's the meaning of that? It means that at least for some inputs, I mentioned that depth is the length of this path, the number of comparisons. At least for some inputs, you need to do it n log n comparison. That means that any, so it, so it might be the case for some case, you might do it faster, depending on the things. But in general, the depth of this one is n log n. So there are some instances for them, it takes n log n comparison. This is essentially the, I mean, the main intuition. You can also read it in the book, uh, the OD members introduction to uh, algorithm, a creative approach or the CLRS. That's also, there is that paper, and that's also it is mentioned. Lower bound for comparison based uh, sorting algorithm. So we need, but this is the main idea. This, this is the tree, it has n factorial, the num, it's a binary tree and it, it, any binary tree essentially. So in general, if you have a, bin, a, bin, a binary tree with n nodes, the depth of that would be log of n. Here n is becomes n factorial and the log of n factorial we discussed before, it becomes n log n. That we mentioned. Uh, good. So let me clear all drawings here. Good. So uh, is it, uh, uh, let me say uh, one or uh, problem and then we will continue uh, after that. So uh, this is the maximum and minimum element. So say that instead of the sorting the whole array, we want to just find, I mean, the rank i elements. We define, I define the rank. Rank one means that the, like say the list elements then, or the minimum elements, rank two means that second list elements and so on and so forth, good. Say you don't want to find the, you don't want to sort the whole array, but you want to just sort, you want to just get the rank of each element, a given element in this array. That's, that's a very important thing. I mean, the ranking is a very important one. You may have all, all possibilities and you want to find what is the ranking of this. So you may think about this one. For example, you are at Amazon and there are some of these elements, some other, so you are seeing one page and one element or one item to buy. They want to rank all other items for you and say that who are the 10 other uh, L, uh, items that you might be interested in. How do they rank them? Rank them those 10 guys that you have the possible highest, uh, uh, essentially, uh, um, so, so you will be uh, 
essentially likes these 10 elements the most. And they will show you those ones as a sponsor. If you go actually to Amazon website, you will see that. This is the thing that they say is sponsored. How do they compute it? They compute essentially all items that they have it. They will give you the first 10 items that they believe you like the most. So this is the ranking scene. So you need to see if this item, if I show to this person, what is the rank of that? If the rank is high, I will show it. If rank is low, I don't show it. Good. So in that case, uh, we have uh, this concept of maximum and minimum elements. So if you want to just find the maximum elements, or like if, uh, so we want to find the first rank element or the nth rank element. Good. So as I mentioned, you want to find the top most element essentially for the person to show you. How do we find the maximum element? How many comparisons need, we need to find that one? Y n. Okay. Actually, we need n minus one. Correct. Because you will consider this one each two elements. You will compare it. One of them is less than the other. If they are equal, you can just take any of them. And again, always you can think about no two equal things because you can add a small noise to each of these guys. So what do we do? We are just considering these elements. And uh, then uh, like you just compare the first two elements. One of them is less than the other will be removed. The winner will go to the next one and so on and so forth. We need to, that is exactly the argument that we had it before. We need to remove N minus one elements and in each comparison, one element will be removed from the further consideration. And we need to remove N minus one element. So we need N minus one. Similarly, if we want to do this one, this is for maximum. What about if we want to do it for minimum? What? Same thing, N minus. Now, this is the question. How can we find both maximum and minimum at the same time? Least, essentially uh, something that you like the most or some, and some, the one that you like the least. At the same time, can we do anything better? That's the thing that we will uh, talk essentially more, and we are talking a little bit more about this ranking next time. Good. Any questions? Good. So if there's no further question, we can finish today and then we will continue next week.